grab your Bibles and join me in Luke chapter number 14. We revisit the passage where we were last week, and uh, we jump back into it, Luke chapter 14. If you need a copy of the Scriptures, there's one there in um, front of you. We'd love for you to follow along as we jump back into the passage, kind of continue where we left off. Last week, we shared a message entitled, Simply Land, Livestock, and a Lady. From here in verses 16 and 17, you remember, Christ gives a story. It's a parable. And in that story, he details for us the great salvation invitation to all. And we summarized it by that simple word found in this passage, come, right? Come. He invites all to come. And the great news about that invitation to come is that all things are now ready is what he says in those verses. It's all been prepared. In fact, it's all taken care of. Nothing is required of the person who's been invited to come. And so it is true of salvation. We are to come. Jesus Christ died on the cross. He, he shed his blood for our sins. He paid it all as we heard a moment ago. And when he bowed his head that last time, he said, it is finished. That's exactly what it means. You see, the, your seat at the table of God for God's feast in heaven to come is made completely available and fully ready. Salvation, escaping hell, heaven, lake of fire, gaining heaven, eternity with him is, is ready if you'll receive that free gift through faith and trust in him. It's all been taken care of. It's ready for you. But even though that's true, we understood that Jesus Christ knew that there'd be some. He understood that there'd be some that refuse that invitation. In fact, um, some who will trust in their own power, their own strength, their own thoughts, their own abilities, rather than Jesus Christ, who's already done it all for them. They'll make excuses, and that's what we found here in this passage, right? Christ enumerates, he, he kind of delineates some of the fact that there are people who make excuses every day for not coming to Jesus Christ, for not coming to church, for, for not even thinking about eternity and putting their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You, you remember the three excuses that were given. The first one was land, right? I need to go. I purchased some land. I need to go inspect it. We saw the frivolous of that excuse. Number two was livestock, right? And I bought uh, 10 oxen. I need to go, or five teams, 10 oxen. Uh, and I need to go inspect them, prove them is the terminology. Again, a frivolous excuse, uh, somewhat a bold-faced lie, really. And then last but not least, the gentleman who got married, right? And uh, used his bride as the excuse not to, not to, not to come in as he was invited. We looked at the emptiness and the foolishness of each of these excuses, how it's readily recognized. Then we said, you know what? These are great examples of excuses of people, uh, excuses that people give for not coming to Jesus Christ. Last week, we shared with you eight of them, right? There's uh, many more, but eight excuses sometimes people use for not accepting this invitation to trust in Jesus Christ. And um, as we sum those up, then we turn to Matthew chapter 22 and as Christ also had a parable there, he, he said in that same parable, all things are ready, come to the marriage feast. The people there too offered excuses. And you remember how Christ described it? And this really sums up all of those eight in, in the, the frivolousness of people's excuses for not trusting Jesus Christ today. Christ described them as this, but they made light of it. They made light of it. I can think, as I said last week, as we ended, no worse response than anyone that anyone can give to the invitation of salvation than to take it lightly, to disregard its importance and significance, to to say it's not worth your time and attention. Can I encourage you this morning? Don't be that person. Don't leave today without knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior. Accept his invitation, the free gift of the salvation that he offers. As we return to the passage. I want you to imagine for a moment what happens. Jesus Christ, you remember, he was in the house of the chief priest, right? He was eating dinner with them there, and and there's many people gathered. In fact, in in that day, sometimes if they had a special guest, they'd prepare the eating area outside in a courtyard or or right inside the gate, whatever the case may be. But let's imagine this morning that that meal came to a close. Jesus Christ rose, and as they often reclined, kind of laying down on pillows and things like that, he rose up and he started to leave. In fact, uh, he, he did leave. He got, let's just pretend, he got to the gate or the, the opening the, uh, into the house, and there he gazed his eyes once again upon the throng of people that were waiting on him. In fact, verse 25 alludes to it. There was often at this point in Christ's ministry multitudes of people, throngs of people that followed him wherever he went. I wonder if while Christ was speaking the parable we just heard, I, 
I, I just wonder if maybe it was outside and Jesus Christ had stood up and as he was giving that parable of the man who had a great feast, he said it loud enough for all of those gathered around the gate and out in the road and uh, to hear and to listen. Perhaps, perhaps he had said it loud enough for each one of them to hear that invitation. Well, the story goes, we can imagine, Jesus Christ comes outside the house and Perhaps he, he, he carries on a little bit. He kind of goes his way, and all these people begin to follow him again down the road, down the path. And, and, and we, it begs the question, we might ask, why in the world would they follow Jesus Christ like this? Why would people leave their daily lives and go after him and, and to, uh, to follow him? Well, certainly there would be some who would want to see a great miracle, right? They'd want to see a miracle, maybe even participate in one. There'd be others who had heard of the, uh, the, the feeding the, that uh, he had done, the feeding of the 5,000 and others. And can I tell you right now, uh, there'd be some there who came and followed him hoping for a free lunch, hoping that he'd do such a thing again and they'd eat uh, freely. Others there, can I tell you right now, there are some in that crowd that would have been there to see a revolution. They were hoping that he would lead a revolution to throw off the oppressive Roman dogs and had to regain once again the, the rulership of Israel to establish the throne of David as was promised in the Old Testament. Some there would have desired that and wanted that and would have followed him. These were not interested in spiritual things. But certainly among that crowd, that multitude of verse 25 describes it. There would have been some there who among their number, who had already accepted the invitation that God had given them, this invitation of salvation, to come unto him. They had laid aside their excuses. They had simply come and sit down at God's table through faith and trust in Jesus Christ. For those in that crowd who had done so, for us here today that have trusted in Jesus Christ, Christ is now going to teach us another lesson. He has something else to teach. As he's the great teacher, he never uh, allows an opportunity to slip by. And so we read in this, and we can imagine he walks a little further down the road, and the crowd begins to follow him slowly but surely. And, and maybe he goes to an open area, maybe where a couple roads come together, or maybe he even finds his way to the nearest or nearby hillside. And he arrives there, and uh, the crowd just kind of follows along, and abruptly Jesus Christ stops. As he stops, the crowd slowly, it works its way back, and, and the crowd stops and wondering, okay, why, why is he stopping here? What's the, what's the purpose of stopping here? And, and they're kind of wondering, you can imagine all the eyes kind of going to Jesus, and what's he doing now? Where's he going now? What's going to happen? And slowly but surely, we can imagine the conversations drop off. People stop talking. Speech is quieted. He has their attention. By the... The multitude has come to a standstill. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ then turns. And he begins to teach them. Look with me, if you will, verse 25. Let's hear what Jesus Christ said to this group. And there, was, there went great multitudes with him. And he turned. And he said unto them, If any man come to me, and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters. Yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Wow. <laughs> That's quite the inclusive list, amen? It's like the whole family get together, amen? They're all there, including self. And this is, what a statement, right? Because what happens? Well, even in this statement, he does something. He reiterates what he just said in the house in a small, minute statement. Notice it, if you will, with me. The first invitation is here, but it's followed by another. The first invitation is what he just gave the parable about. Come unto me in faith. If any man come to me, he says it again here. That's the first invitation. But it's quickly followed by a second invitation. There's two comes. There's two invitations. He's saying, listen, come unto me in faith. That's for everyone. Come. Then there's a second invitation that's given, and it's given in verse 27. Look there. Verse 27 of Luke chapter 14. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciples. Now, that's interesting. The first one said what? Come to me. Come to me in faith. Now we have the second come, the second invitation, and that's follow me. 
In fact, both in verse 26 and verse 27, he uses a term in his invitation. He says, listen, I want you to be a disciple. You ought to come and be my disciple. I've saved you. You've trusted in me. That's a free gift. It's yours. Come unto me in salvation and faith. But I also want you to come to me as a disciple, as a follower. I love that term disciple. It is used extensively through the gospel in the first part of the New Testament. That term disciple, what is it that Christ speaks of? He uses it. He says a disciple as a learner. A one who attaches himself or herself to a teacher in order to learn from and emulate that person. That's what Christ is speaking of. That's his invitation today. For you to get serious about being a disciple. You're a saved person. You've trusted in Jesus Christ. You're a part of the family of God. Now, he says, I want to offer a second invitation. I want, to, I, I, I want to send you a little invitation card because I want you to be a disciple. I want you to be a learner. I want you to be someone who follows me and learns from me and emulates, follows my example. In modern speak, or maybe a, a more modern use of a term, we might compare it to the term apprentice. One who learns by following and watching closely so that he or she might do likewise. Amazingly, this term, disciple, it was used the most of any term to describe the dedicated followers of Jesus Christ in the gospel in the book of Acts. Do you realize this term is used over 250 times? 250 times. As Christ used the term, he makes something very clear. The discipleship invitation involves more than what accepting the salvation invitation required. Anyone can easily come and trust in Jesus Christ. Anyone can come to him. It's wide open. It's all taken care of. It's all ready. Everything's been provided. All you have to do is show up with faith. Trust him. All one needs to do is come and accept your place by faith. But to come be a disciple... Oh, that's a different matter. You see, Jesus make, is making a, dis, a, a distinction between salvation and discipleship. One is a free gift. The other one is only for those who are willing to pay. Why? Because discipleship costs. You want to follow Christ. You want to be a disciple. You're going to accept the invitation to be a follower of Jesus Christ. It will cost you. That's the teaching Christ now turns and speaks to this entire group, this multitude. You have to be willing to pay the price. Number one, you say, okay, what does that mean? Well, there's four things that Christ makes clear. Number one, you need to count the cost. You need to count the cost and then commit to being a disciple. Jesus Christ is telling the crowd along with us today that uh, being a disciple should not be committed to lightly. It ought not to be committed to lightly. There's indeed a cost. Take stock of the cost Christ encourages. Understand fully what you're entering into, what you're pursuing. In fact, he gives us two parables to illustrate and encourage this next step on our part. Look at verses 28 and 32, if you will. Look at verse 28. Notice what he says. He's just kind of blown their minds, right? If the crowd hadn't already stopped in their tracks, that would have said it. you got to hate your mother and father. You need to uh, take up your cross. Verse 28, he gives an illustration, another parable. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, notice the statement, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest happily after he hath laid the foundation is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Now that's interesting. Count the cost. Verse 31, or, or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an, an, an ambassador, an ambassador, right? An ambassador, and desireth conditions of peace. That's an interesting statement. Two parables. Notice that what happens. If, he says, if one were to enter into a construction project, if you're going to add on to your house, if, if for whatever reason you're going to build a tower onto your house, amen? Okay? If you're going to build something, if you're going to enter into a construction project, you would plan, you would prepare with forethought. In our modern vernacular, you know what we say? You know what you're getting yourself into. 
you know what it's going to cost you. You know what you're going to have to expend. You know, you know what you have to have free to put into it. You know what the cost is going to be. You're going you're gonna to make sure you know exactly what it's going to cost. And uh, you, you'll plan. So you can see it through to the end. Likewise, a king. A, a king who's going to enter a war or a battle against a fellow king, another nation. He would first consider and analyze whether the war or the battle could even be won. Can I even do this? Is it possible? What's it going to cost me? He does his due diligence to confirm that he could commit the necessary resources to ensure the success and victory were assured. Otherwise, he's sending an ambassador to try to get peace. I'm not going to go into it without knowing that I can win it, that I can have success. He'll do his due diligence. It's interesting, two parables, because Christ is saying this in the, the context of discipleship. You and I, following after Christ, uh, that, that we do certain things, that we understand discipleship caused. It just doesn't happen. It's not something that's going to be a hobby. It's not just something that we, we follow Christ, yeah, kind of willy-nilly. And no, count the cost and then commit to being a disciple. He encourages us to do likewise. Before we accept the invitation, before we answer the call to be his disciples, I said, Pastor, that's pretty, wow, that's, that, that's pretty blunt. That's, that's kind of in your face. And, and I would point this out, you know, not in this passage, but there's other passages that speak of the great reward of being a disciple. It's very interesting. In this passage, Christ does not mention, oh, you know what? If you be my disciple, you're going to reap this, you're going to reap this, you're going to reap this, you're going to have great reward. It's the great payoff, as I like to call it, for being a disciple. And there is. The Bible speaks to that time and time and time again. Can I tell you right now, if you choose to accept the invitation to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you'll never regret it. There is great reward, though Christ doesn't speak about it in this passage. That's not its focus. But just to encourage you this morning, can I share one of those passages with you? Notice this passage, if you will, Mark chapter 10, verses 29 and 30. Notice what Christ says. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house and brethren and sisters and father and mother, wife, children. Listen to me. That's another, another ex, uh, uh, inclusive list, isn't it? Almost everything that he just listed here in Luke chapter 14 and verse 26, if you hate these, he says, listen, if you've left those, if you've left them behind in your priorities and in your emphasis in your life, and those don't come before Jesus Christ, for my sake, for the gospel's sake, and he adds and follows in verse 30, but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time. And houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions. And in the world to come during that eternal life. Eternal life. It's a great promise. It's great rewards that if you and I will follow him and put him first. But that is not the focus of this passage. When Jesus Christ turns and this great multitude and congregation and throng of people that has followed him. And they've heard about the great invitation, to, the free invitation to salvation. Now he's turning and speaking and teaching them about this call, this invitation to discipleship. And he's encouraging them to count the cause. You see, there's no argument that there is great reward and blessing for being a disciple of Jesus Christ today and the next day and in the future. But that's not what Christ mentions here. It's not his focus. His focus is on exhorting us about the cost of discipleship, knowing that it requires and commits us to pay the price of discipleship in this life. You say, then, what is the cost? Well, he makes that clear. Number two, you count the cost and you commit to being a disciple. Number two, you choose him above everything and anything else. You choose him above everything and any, everyone else. That is literally what verse 26 is saying, isn't it? Hate, hate, you, you hate your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your brethren, your sisters, and your own life also. And then would you look at verse 33? Here's the end of the parable. Notice it. So likewise, whoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, hmm, he cannot be my disciples. You see it? Look at that verse again. Verse 33. So, what's the next word? Likewise. What's he tying it to? He's tying it to the two parables. That builder, that constructor, that contractor. He's tying it to the king. The king who counted the cause. He says, you and I, we likewise have to count the cause. 
That example, the tower builder, the king, the army, going, uh, to, uh, going to war with an army. They knew the cost beforehand. So here we are told to count the cost of discipleship. What is the cost of discipleship? First and foremost, can I tell you right now, it is forsaking all but Christ. That's what he said. So likewise, whoever, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath. And immediately, you and I are confronted with difficulty. Forsake it all. Choosing him above all. I like the picture of the Greek word used here. It it is the idea of separation. In fact, what's interesting, that Greek term is used to describe a military camp. A military camp was often set apart from a city. It was set apart from the, the regular citizenry because they wanted it separated. They wanted the focus of the soldiers to be on what was ahead, the war, the battle. They didn't want distraction. They didn't have leave time to go into the town and, and corrals and everything else. No, they were set apart. The camp was set up somewhere else. This is the picture here. You've forsaken all. You've set up somewhere. Modernly, can I tell you what we might compare it to? Boot camp. How many of you here have been to boot camp? You've been in the Army and the Armed Forces. Well, God bless you. You made it through. Amen. What a challenge that was, right? We have a couple of young men that have gone here recently in the last few years. And boy, I love it. I love the stories of, of boot camp and how they, they, they have like nothing to themselves, right? Everything they knew has gone. It's changed. One of my favorite stories is when they walk in and, and some funny barber in the army says, what kind of haircut you want? <laughs> and those poor, that, that poor sucker that says, oh, I'd like this and this, and they laugh at him. They give him a haircut just like everybody else, right? Hey, why? Because boot camp, everything changes. You've forsaken it all. Boy, you get a few minutes a, a week to call back and talk to mom and dad. If that. Everything changes. You don't get to decide when you wake up. You don't get to decide when you go to bed. You don't get to decide what kind of hike you take in the woods. Amen? They determine it all for you. Everything changes. Life as you knew it, you've forsaken it. You kind of left it in the background. Life totally changes for a new recruit in that setting, doesn't it? It really illustrates and pictures well the things that are involved with choosing God above everything and everyone else. My friend, when you and I, I sure am thankful. I'm telling you, I, I, can't, I can't begin to describe how grateful and thankful I am for the sacrifice of those uh, uh, citizens who go into our military to serve our country. But can I tell you right now, when they do so, it isn't about what they want. It's about what Uncle Sam wants, what Uncle Sam says to do. It becomes everything anything about him, about the military orders, the orders that they get, and the commands of the, uh, those in authority over them, and that's a great picture. Because when you and I say, I'm going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, I'm now choosing him above everything and everyone else. He's going to come first. He gets the priority. In fact, if we were to describe it as such, and that picture illustrates, you know what it requires? Forsaking all for Christ. Number two, it also requires the abandoning of all past priorities. The abandoning of all past priorities. What was a priority before is no longer a priority. The things that were first in my preferences in life are no longer my preferences. Because now they're informed by the very will of God. I'm a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. That is included in that forsaking that in verse 33. What you live for, what you pursued before changes both when you come to Christ, but also when you commit to following him as a disciple. It's abandoning of all priorities. And then, as verse 26 would say, it is an embracing and growing a love for Christ that is so strong that it overrules all others in one's life. It's developing and growing. It's feeding a love for Christ that is so strong that it overrules all the love for anything and everyone else. Again, a strong statement. It's a, it's a preferring him above anything and everything else. In fact, including our own flesh. Your love for Christ makes all other love pale in comparison. I like the translation of the word hate. You know what it literally means? It means giving the preference and priority of one thing over another. 
So when Jesus Christ says you, you ought to hate mother and father and sister and brother, gives us a, and self also, it means you take a step back to all of those things. You put them in the back seat and you give them preference. You give them preference. Can I tell you right now? When my family travels somewhere and we go together and we barely fit in vehicles anymore. But anyway, when we go somewhere together, can I just tell you who sits next to me? It's not Reed. Not Caden. Not Carter. Not even Reagan. You know who sits next to me? The love of my life. My wife. She sits next to me. I give her preference. I, I, I want her right there next to me. I give her preference. Does that mean I don't love Reagan? Eh, no, just kidding. That's just, she's down in Tennessee right now, so you tell her I said that, okay? No, of course I love Reagan. Does that mean I don't love Carter? Of course I love Carter. Does that mean I don't love Reed? I love Reed. Even though I was telling my son to school, at about 3 o'clock in the morning, I was woken up with a blanket over my face and a little boy that belly flopped on my face. 3 a.m. in the morning. I said, Carter, is that? No, I didn't. I was just kidding. It was baby Reed. He just, he fell. And then, you know what I hear through this blanket? I hear, <laughs> he thought it was time to play, crazy kid. Can I tell you right now, even in that moment, I loved him. I, I, I love all my children. I, I love them immensely. They are, they are the, the love of my lives. But I'll tell you, they don't compare with my love for Erica. Can I tell you, that's exactly what we need to do with Jesus Christ. We ensure that he is in the front seat. In fact, that analogy kind of falls apart because, honestly, he needs to be behind the wheel. He needs to be driving. But there ain't nothing going to take his place. Nothing pushes him to the back seat. Nothing makes him sit where he ought not to have in the place of preference. See, a disciple of Jesus Christ puts Christ always first, never giving him the back seat to anything or anyone else in our lives. And yet that's a big ask, isn't it? You know what's amazing? It was part of the point that Christ made to Peter. You remember Peter betrayed him. He denied Jesus Christ. Christ goes and finds him fishing. He invites him to that, that dinner of fish on the, the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And as, as he's there, you remember what, what, what Christ said to Peter? You remember it? He said this. Peter, do you love me more than these? Oh. No pun intended, or maybe it is, but Christ got to the heart of the matter. I love the old statement. The heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. See, whether you want to be a disciple, whether you're going to put Jesus Christ first and everything else, it all goes back to your heart, what's in your heart. And that's what Jesus Christ was asking Peter. Hey, Peter, do you love me more than anything? Do you love me more than this? Am I the most important thing in your life? He's not egocentric. He is not a narcissist. Jesus Christ deserves to be your all in all. So am I there, Peter? In fact, it is a question, to take it a step farther, it is as if Jesus Christ is asking you and I today, where does your love for me rank among the loves of your life? And if you want a true, honest answer to that question, would you ponder this statement? Man, I read this a week ago or so. And it has been on my heart and mind ever since. The Holy Spirit kept bringing it back. In fact, this past week, and, and uh, we had the folks come in. They were cleaning the, the carpets and things, and one of them was actually a pastor somewhere, and so he and I got to talking and so forth. I was just sharing this with him because the Lord laid this on my heart and really challenged me with it. It was this statement, and you have to think about it for a moment because immediately we kind of balk at it. We want to we say, ah, that's not true. The more you think about it, we have to be honest and say, you know what? That is kind of true. Not kind of. It is. Here's the statement. Whatever comes to your mind more than anything else is your God. It is what you love more than anything. I told you immediately, man, I, at first I realized, yeah, I don't know if that's true. I don't know if you can say that. I, we kind of balk at it and say, well, you know, I, we might want to argue that I, just because I think about something more than God, and more than thinking about his word, what he would have me to do, etc., it doesn't mean we love that thing more than God. But then the more we think about it, we know that's probably true. 
And I had to challenge myself. What do I think about most? Is it news and politics? Is it sports? Is it a person? That I think about more than God, that I, that I give them more time in my heart and my mind, that I consider them more. Who am I truly a disciple of? Who's my God? Maybe it's just I think about what Stephen Henry wants more than anything else. I entertain what myself and my flesh I want, and I want to do it, and I, I want this, and I, I feel this. And What do you think about more than anything else? Because what do we know is true? Where your thoughts are, your heart soon follows. And where your heart is, that is what you treasure and value the most. These are biblical truths. The Bible says where your heart is, there will be your treasure also. The Bible tells us that our thoughts are the heart of man. These thoughts are what control us. Our hearts are there. So what do you think about more than anything else? There's some teenagers here. Teenager, what do you think about more than anything else? Oh, man, there's a lot in the world. Video games, social media. There's all kinds of things, even for us as adults, that vie for our attention, that, that, that want us thinking about them more than anything else. What do you think about more than anything else? What is the thing that captures and consumes your thoughts? You find that out, you'll find your God, who you really are a disciple of. See, as we strive to choose him above anything and everything else and everyone else, we then begin to do the next thing described here in this verse, look at, or in this passage. Look at verse 27 again. I know we read it once, but let's read it again. He says this, And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciples. Okay, so number three, you know what we are called to do? Carry your cross. So number one, you count the cost, you commit to being a disciple, right? That, that's, that's first and foremost. And number two, you and I choose him above everything and anyone else. And number three, we carry our cross. He doesn't mince words here, right? You need to pick up your cross, you need to carry it. I often wonder when Jesus Christ made statements like this, when he talked about carrying a cross or bearing a cross, I just wonder if Jesus Christ, in his omniscience, even being 100% man, 100% God, if he thought about the day that was coming when he himself would do what the Romans make their, their um, um, prisoners do, their condemned do. Do you think as he said this to the, the crowd, as he turned and he looked at the, the, the crowd and he ta taught them, he said, listen, if you want to be my disciples, you need to bear your cross. I wonder if he thought about that day that was coming when he himself would carry his own literal cross before he could carry it no more. That was a Roman practice. Insult to injury. That they'd have to carry their own cross. Oh, we know the story. Certainly Christ may have done so for a little bit and, and, and could not go any further, so they grabbed um, someone to carry it for him. Maybe he thought of that day that was coming. Just a few chapters earlier in the same book, Christ made the same point in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Notice what he said. And he said to them all, if any man will come after me, that's different. That's not coming to me. That's salvation. But come after me when you want to be my disciples. Let him deny himself. Let him take up his cross daily hmm. and follow me and follow me. Would you focus here for a few minutes? Let's think about what that cross is. Immediately, when you and I think of the cross to us, you know what the cross is? It's salvation, right? It's, it's redemption. It's the payment of our sins that destines us and causes us to have to face hell in the lake of fire. It's forgiveness of those sins. It's eternal life. It's a way for us to gain heaven and have a place in God's family. When we think of the cross, rightfully so, we think of what Christ accomplished, all these things that happened there. But can I ask you this? What was the cross to Jesus Christ? Now, that puts it in a different level. That puts it in a different perspective. What was the cross to Jesus Christ? We'd have to say that this cross, it was his mission. It was the end goal. It was the most difficult thing he, he would ever do. 
It, it was the undesirable means to accomplish the only thing that he could do, what only he could do for us. It was the epitome, and don't miss it, it was the epitome of suffering and shame and of great importance to us this morning. It was surrender to the will of God the Father. See, the day came when Jesus Christ was in that garden of Gethsemane. And the only thing that laid ahead of him was the cross of Calvary. And all the persecution and all the torment that laid ahead. That was all that was there in front of him. The next thing that was going to happen after he was betrayed by Judas was the cross. And as he knelt in prayer and conversed in fellowship with God the Father, you remember what he said? Boy, I sure would like this cup to pass from me. But nevertheless... Not my will, but thy will be done. You want to know what the cross was to Jesus Christ? For you and I, it was salvation. It was redemption. For you and I, it was, it was everything we could ever dream of having because sin had separated us from God. But the cross for Jesus Christ, it was the mission. It was the end goal. It was the means by which he would submit to the will of God the Father. And so, my friend, when Jesus Christ himself, when he... He looks to you and I. After we've trusted him salvation, when he looked on that multitude, he said, listen, if you want to be my disciple, you need to take up your cross. You need to deny yourself. You need to bear your cross. This is what he was talking about. You see, my friend, he speaks to all of his disciples of every age when he tells us to take up our cross, to bear our cross, to carry our cross. This cross is a, it's a daily identification with Christ and shame and suffering. And don't miss it. Surrender to God's will. See, Christ in Luke chapter 9, he would describe it as denying self. It's dying to self. It's crucifying my own will, my own ambitions. And when we do that to the degree that God calls us to do, all that it leaves behind in us is a willingness, a desire to please him to do as he directs, to serve him as he commands, to do his will, to be that servant. You see, historically, no one has ever willingly accepted or picked up their cross of crucifixion outside of Christ and his followers. But that's exactly what he calls us to do as his disciples, his followers. Gladly, willingly accept the cross that Christ has put before you. Die to your flesh every day yourself. Do it time and time again. Pick up your cross every day. Live as a servant of Jesus Christ, doing his will from the heart. This is the life of a disciple. This is the cost of discipleship. Such a Christian never goes far without carrying his cross of crucifixion of the self, of flesh, with him. Oh, it's a strong exhortation. It's a demanding passage. And Christ ends it with one more strong illustration. Look at verse 34, will you? It's quite interesting that this occurs here real quickly. Verse 34, salt is good. Can I just stop you right there? And I'm telling you right now, Jesus Christ is a man after my own heart. Amen. Salt is good. Amen. I'm going to share that with my doctor. Amen. Jesus said salt is good. He must have been a southerner. But anyway. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewithal shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land, nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. Then he says this, he that hath ears, let him hear. Now, that's an amazing statement. Now, honestly, we read these two verses, and it seems like it's out of place. What does this have to do with discipleship? Jesus Christ has just talked about, and you saw the, the, the title of the message, hate. Okay, uh, hate a cross and forsaking all. What does salt have to do with this? Why, why would he bring this up at the end of this? That, that just seems kind of out of place. It doesn't seem to flow. It, it seems, uh, again, kind of odd. Well, here's the point. Number four, don't miss it. He's encouraging you and I to commit to failure not being an option. Commit to failure not being an option. Here's what's interesting. And this helps us with our understanding of the scriptures. The salt in Jesus' day was not pure like the salt we have today. Very seldom today we'd find salt that has lost its savor. We'd, we'd find salt that has lost its flavor. But in that day, it wouldn't take much for the salt to lose its seasoning. If it came in touch with something else, if it was polluted in some way, it would quickly lose its flavor, its seasoning. It wasn't pure in that day. It would lose its capability of seasoning or flavor. 
And once that was lost, even this pictures it. There's no way to restore it. Jesus said it's not good. It's not, it just has to be cast out. It's not any good. And he had already told us what? Now, don't miss that. He had already told his followers, those who came to him in salvation, ye are the what of the earth? The salt of the earth. You're the salt of the earth. He already said that. You're stabbed. You come to me in faith. You're the salt of the earth. Now he's saying, let's be careful. Let's not lose our flavor. You see, we are made salt when we come to Jesus Christ. And to commit to discipleship, but not to give it our all. To quit when going gets tough. To simply stop putting him first. In other words, when we start putting Jesus Christ in the back seat. When he is not everything to us. When he, he does not, our love for him does not overrule our love for everything else. All of a sudden, we're starting to lose our flavor as salt. Starting to lose our savor, the passage would say. We are like salt that neither seasons or preserves. It just doesn't serve much good. We fail to accomplish in this world what we are to achieve as Christ's disciples, being the salt of the earth. Back in Luke chapter 9, Jesus Christ would give another little teaching session on being a follower of Jesus Christ. We don't have time. We were going to go there, but we're running out of time. But let me share the last verse, verse 62. Notice what Jesus Christ says. This was in a discussion about following him. And some people say, well, I'm going to follow you, but let me go do this. I'm going to follow you, but let me do this first. Let me put this first. Let me put this first. And here's what Jesus Christ said. Jesus said unto him, no man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, it's fit for the kingdom of God. What that verse literally means at the end, you're fit for the service of the kingdom of God. Because just a couple verses earlier, he makes it clear. He's talking about discipleship, not salvation. It's not your name as part of the family of God. That's not what he's saying. It's not fit for the kingdom of God. He's saying you're not fit. In fact, he talks about preaching. He talks about teaching. He talks about reaching out in verses prior. So he comes to this verse. He says, listen, if you're the kind of person that you say, you know what? I come to faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I want to live for him. I've, I've been baptized. I've declared that I'm going to follow Jesus. But you keep looking back. Your salt that has lost its flavor. Your salt that's lost its flavor. Forgive me, but this week I had that happen to me. I was talking to somebody on the phone that wanted to sell us something as a church, and I was conversing with this guy. Come to find out, he was a Catholic. He knew by the name of our church, we're Baptists, and so forth. And he began in this conversation, he was a very friendly person, and so we talked about a few things, and some things that we certainly disagree with scripture-wise, but as we began to talk, he made a comment, well, oh yeah, I used to have a co-worker, I had a co-worker, he was a Baptist too, and I'm sure he believes some of the things that you believe, but I'll tell you right now, and he brings up this one thing, he said, but he sure didn't live like that. What was I supposed to say to that? Because immediately, you know what he told me? You know what that statement meant? That salt had lost its flavor. The salt had lost its flavor. For whatever reason, this man did not take up his cross. This man did not forsake all for Christ. This man did not allow his love to overrule all the love for anything and everything else, everyone else in his life, to such a degree that this person said, wow, he is a follower of Jesus Christ. Lost his flavor. So can I just tell you right now, you know what Jesus Christ is saying by giving us this illustration of the salt? Listen, my friend, commit to being a disciple. Count the cost and don't look back. Don't let anything else become your first love again. Take up your cross and don't put it down. Tomorrow, don't live unto the flesh. Take up your cross. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Don't live what you want to do. Do what Christ wants you to do as he reveals in his word. Don't look back. Don't open the door to failure as salt. Don't let not being a faithful disciple be an option in your life. Could I encourage you, as we go to this invitation, would you remember these three things? Would you ask God, or four things, excuse me, would you ask God where your failure might be as a disciple? Have you count the cost? Have you committed to being a real disciple of Jesus Christ? Have you, do you constantly choose him above everything and everyone else? You abandon prior priorities. You embrace and grow the love for Christ that is so strong that it overrules all other loves in your life. Is he the thing in his word and his will, the thing that you think about more than anything? Or do you have another God? 
carry your cross? Would you deny yourself tomorrow? Would you pick up your cross daily? I, I love that. Daily, he said. Take up that cross. Deny yourself daily. Do you do it? Then last but not least, would you commit tonight, this morning, would you commit to failure not being an option? Father, I don't want to be salt that's lost its flavor. Help me to the day I die to have the flavor of Jesus Christ.